Okay, um, and so tonight we are pleased to welcome Ricardo Cortez to discuss his latest book, A Secret History of Coffee, Coca, and Cola, A Tale of Coffee, Coca, Cola, Coca-Cola, Caffeine, Cocaine, Secret Formulas, Special Flavors, Special Favors, and the Future of Prohibition. Cortez is the creator and illustrator of a series of subversive books for all ages, for mostly all ages, about such things as marijuana, bombing, and the Jamaican bobsled team. His latest book examines a series of highly addictive substances that have caused many deaths and fueled much, much profit, um, and how they make their way into the U.S. and what the U.S. government's role has been in ensuring that they come into this country. All right? And this evening, we are pleased to be joined by two drug policy experts as well, IPS fellow San Ho Tree and Coletta Youngers, a senior fellow at the Washington Office on Latin America. And without further ado, I want to hand it over to the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for coming out here. I'm really excited. I just came in from New York. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I'm going to start off by, by talking a little bit about my book, and then we're going to go into a little bit about, um, about where the, which focuses on, on coca and coca policy, and, and then we'll get into the, how that's relevant, especially this week, and what's going on at the UN, um, and, and the history of, of the treaty that, that basically prohibits coca around the world. Um, my book actually started out as a children's book. Um, it started out uh, as a, as a follow-up to a children's book I did about marijuana back in 2004, 2005. Uh, it wasn't a, a book about teaching kids how to smoke weed, but it was rather uh, an educational book about a parent that might, how they might talk to their kids about a difficult subject um, that, you know, that they might all run into. Um, so that's why the format is kind of like an illustrated picture book um, for kids. But as I got deeper into the subject and started looking into coca, which originally I thought, you know, is relevant to some children's lives in South America. It's, it's not so far removed. There are children that pick it. Um, there are families that are involved in the, uh, in the oppressive uh, policies to eradicate coca, and, and it's a, it, that's a family issue as well as a, so, a social and cultural issue. Um, but as I got deeper into the history of coca, uh, and specifically with the relationship to the Coca-Cola company, the origins of, of cocaine um, from, from a medical marvel to, uh, to, the, to the, the drug problem we have today, uh, it, got, it got really complicated, and, and, and so hence it's now it's in a, a book for adults. Um, I also started back before coca um, as a, a secret history of coffee, coca, and cola. I started with coffee because I wanted to do a comparison of something that's always fascinated me with, with the way that drugs, plants change their um, perceptions of these drugs and plants change over time. The cultural perceptions of them, the legal, the social perceptions. Uh, I was inspired by Michael Pollan's book, The Botany of, <laughs> Botany of Desire, where he talks about the histories of four different plants, one being apples and how when apples first came to this country, um, they weren't the, 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 f the fleshy fruit that we all know today, we eat, but they were used for fermentation purposes. People would get drunk, and hence there were people that wanted to ban the apple. Um, I looked further and I found that there were other plants similarly that today you would say that's incredible that people would have problems with tomatoes, that it was a witch's fruit, or, or potatoes that weren't in the Bible, so that we should have problems with it. Um, and then, and obviously now coffee, and coffee was fascinating because there were points, um, this great origin myths of coffee, and then eventually uh, going throughout the Islamic world, and there were questions of the, to the health of it, the, the, um, the, the religious legality of it, and there were times where coffee was banned, coffee houses were shut down, um, sometimes for health reasons, but also for political reasons. There were, there were sites of sedition and sites of, of, of political discourse. Um, but so I saw that this, this coffee is, was another plant um, with an alkaloid at its principal uh, active ingredient, the caffeine of the coffee, um, that was something that was, went through these cycles of, of, of experimentation and then, and then um, prohibition and then obviously acceptance. Uh, there's, coffee is pretty much legal in most parts of the United States today. Um, so coca is a, a similar plant, it's very similar. It's sometimes picked on the same mountainsides by the same people. Um, and they both have an alkaloid as its principal active ingredient. The, the caffeine and the, coca the cocaine um, 
are, are both in their, are in their pure form, very powerful stimulants. Um, caffeine is actually toxic in, in, its, in its purest form. Um, and so I, I just wanted to make a comparison about those two plants, and that's why I went so, so far back to go into the, to the history of coffee um, and, and get a little bit into the history of, of, of the origins of co cocaine. And that's when it, it crept into the, the, the question of Coca-Cola, the Coca-Cola company, which is something that always fasc fascinated me because I've always, I grew up with those rumors that there was cocaine and Coca-Cola. Um, is it, was there ever cocaine? Yes, there was cocaine and Coca-Cola. Um, it was Coca-Cola started to take the cocaine out of Coca-Cola in about 1902, 1903. Um, they met a, a German cocaine maker, uh, Louis Schaefer, who basically was the, was the, the person who would take out the cocaine um, at a facility out in New Jersey. And as we, we can talk about today, uh, that, that, pharm that pharmaceutical company, that chemical pr processing company is still there today. It's called Steppen, uh, Steppen Company. Um, you can go on the, uh, you can go on the, the DEA website and, and every year see that how they have to register to import coca leaf for, uh, and, and register for the uh, production of cocaine as a co controlled substance. So, um, yeah, so I, I went into that history too and basically found out that Coca-Cola has been getting access to coca leaf uh, for the past century. And then where this all comes together today and, and what we're going to also get into is that the coca became prohibited around, around the world um, through, through uh, one of three treaties that now uh, dictates international drug policy. And it's the, the first one is called the 1961 Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs. And that was, that was the treaty that today still says that uh, Bolivia is supposed to eradicate all their wild coca bushes and we have to stop the, the chewing of coca, something that has been going on uh, in South America for thousands of years. And the Coca-Cola company had a role in the negotiations of that treaty. Um, I went through the National Archives and what you see a lot in this book, there's actually illustrations of the pictures that I took in the archives of the documents. Um, instead of a prose book and, and writing all the words out, I went, I, f I found all the, I found boxes and boxes of documents of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics and the personal files of Harry Anslinger, who was the longtime commissioner of the Bureau of Narcotics. I took photographs of them um, and then I illustrated them. So, so what you'll see in the book is actually, rather than retell the story in words, I actually recreated the, these documents and these letters and this correspondence that happened over decades and decades, uh, literally decades and decades and decades, between Harry Anslinger, um, who you may know as the, the architect of the Reefer Madness campaign against marijuana. That was, that was one of his strong, um, he was really active in, in, and successful in prohibiting marijuana. Um, at the same time, he was also the point man for, for the federal government in its, in its negotiations uh, at the UN to, to codify the laws against coca. While that was happening, uh, Harry Anslinger was in constant communication with the Coca-Cola company, uh, primarily through the vice president, Ralph Hayes, who I, I really got to uh, feel a, a relationship over, between them over, over time. Um, they, they just had a really interesting parlay between, uh, between each other. Um, yeah, so that, that's a, that's a beginning of, um, of an overview of, of the book. Um, I think I, I want to be able to pass us, pass the mic back and forth and I, and, and I think we're going to have questions for each other, but, um, but yeah, that, that's, that's the beginning. Good evening. Uh, my name is San Ho Tree from the Institute for Policy Studies where I run the drug policy project there. And, uh, you know, I was once asked to uh, talk to a group of high school students and uh, they looked at your resume and your background and then they came up with a topic and you had to speak to the topic. And this being a high school audience, they wanted to hear about sex, drugs and international relations. <laughs> and I thought, Lord, how am I going to tie all these three things together? And it didn't dawn on me until, of course, the last minute. Um, and I realized the way to tell that story was through the story of Columbus, who I consider to be the granddaddy of, of dr international drug traffickers. Um, and I use that word drugs because it's relative. You know, how you see the world depends on, on, on where you sit, where you stand, and your perspective. 
And so I want to reframe this discussion for us uh, in ways that we perhaps may not think of uh, very often. You know the story of Columbus. He was after the spice route to, to Asia. 